In this segment, we're going to introduce the fundamentals of convection. So if we worked some problems involving convection this semester, uh, let's consider a plate that's at a higher temperature than the fluid that's flowing over it. Because the plate is hotter than the fluid, heat flows from the plate to the fluid, and that fluid has a temperature of T infinity and, convective, and a convective coefficient H. Now up until this point, we've been given a value for that heat transfer coefficient H, but going forward, we're gonna need to calculate that heat transfer coefficient. There are several different ways that we can do that. We can get analytical solutions for very simple geometries, and what that involves is applying several conservation equations and solving all three of those differential equations. Um, so there are three boundary layer equations, the conservation of mass, the conservation of energy, and the conservation of momentum. This is not a trivial task, and we'll be looking at an overview of some of the very clever solutions to these equations for the simple geometry of flow over a flat place, uh, a flat plate. In most cases, though, um, an analytical solution is not possible, and we'll have to rely on empirical relationships. In fact, for turbulent flow, which we'll discuss sh shortly, uh, there are no analytical solutions. Um, those empirical relationships, which have been generalized and scaled up from experimental data, will allow us to solve for H. But before we get to those empirical relationships, let's talk about some of the fundamentals of convection. We know that convection is the thermal energy exchange between a surface and a moving fluid, so it stands to reason that we need to know a little, of, a little bit about fluid mechanics to get a handle on it. We're gonna look at a flat knife-edged plate. Fluid is coming in at some uniform velocity, u infinity. As soon as it hits that plate, the plate perturbs the flow. And what we call the boundary layer is defined as the region into, into the fluid flow where the effects of that plate can be felt. Let's look at our velocity field. You see that it's a vector, which means it has direction and magnitude. You see, from, you see that the free stream velocity, u infinity, comes in parallel to our flat edged plate. And we, if we define the x direction as being parallel to the x axis, we see that u infinity is in the x direction. So u is the velocity in uh, the x direction. Um, you can see that this velocity is a function of where you are along the length of the plate or the x coordinate. Um, you can also see that it's a function of how far away from the plate you are or the y coordinate. You also have a velocity within the y direction, which we term little v, although its contribution is small as compared to the velocity in the x direction, u. Let's look at the different regions. Uh, some flow is smooth and orderly, others are chaotic. You could see that the flow that is coming in is smooth and orderly. Uh, the fluid particles are moving in streamlines that are adjacent to one another with no mixing um, of no mixing of particles between those layers. Um, but as it hits that leading edge, um, as it hits that leading edge, the flow is disrupted. But the flow is still pretty orderly. There's no mixing of those layers um, of the flowing molecules as they slide past each other very smoothly. Um, and the reason that the flow is disrupted is because there's friction between the fluid and the plate. In fact, at the surface, uh, the velocity is zero. This is termed the no-slip condition. So the velocity is zero right at the plate, but as we move away from the plate, the velocity will eventually get to the free stream velocity, which we termed u infinity. The layer that you see developing is the boundary layer, or the velocity boundary layer. It's defined as the thickness y, where the velocity is 99% that of the free stream velocity. This boundary layer is the region of flow in which the effects of viscosity are felt. In other words, um, it's the region of flow in which the effects of flow over the plate are felt into the fluid. We can relate the viscosity to the velocity with this defining equation for viscosity. This is the dynamic viscosity. Um, so you can see that the higher the viscosity, the higher the shear stress between the fluid and the plate. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. The higher the resistance, the higher the viscosity. Viscosity is just a property, which you can look up in your property tables at the back of your book. Sometimes you'll see this in terms of kinematic viscosity, which is just the dynamic viscosity mu divided by the density. So as you can see, the shear stress can be found if we know something about the velocity profile. That might not be easy to get at. 
um, a practical relationship involves the friction coefficient. And we can also relate that to the drag force exerted on the plate by the fluid. Um, while it may seem strange to be talking about friction coefficients, um, as we'll see, the friction coefficient can often be related to the heat transfer coefficient. Uh, a little bit farther down the plate at some critical distance from the leading edge, the flow starts to become just a little more disorganized and you start to see a little bit of mixing occur. That transition to turbulence doesn't occur all at once. This is the region before the flow becomes completely turbulent. And after that transition region, the, the flow becomes completely turbulent. That turbulent region is characterized by random mixing and no clear streamlines. There is a very thin uh, laminar sublayer, but the majority of the flow within that boundary layer in that region is turbulent. The governing equations for flow in that boundary layer are going to be very different depending on whether we have laminar or turbulent flow. So we have to have a way to characterize when that transition takes place. The XC value that we've circled in pink here is determined from the Reynolds number. Uh, so the Reynolds number is a dimensionless number. We have different cutoffs. Uh, we have different cutoffs for um, different geometries of what the Reynolds number can be uh, before at a critical distance from the leading edge, the flow becomes turbulent. So we're gonna be talking about the critical Reynolds number for a flat plate. Um, and you might see slight variations in literature uh, regarding this number, uh, but 500,000 is the critical Reynolds number for flow over a flat plate that we'll use here. Um, the reason that you see variation is that the critical Reynolds number is dependent on the surface roughness and the level of turbulence in the free stream. Um, in reality, the Reynolds number may vary between 100,000 and 3 million. Now let's talk about the thermal boundary layer. So we have the same knife edged plate, but this time we're considering that it's heated such that the temperature of the surface is Ts. The free stream is at some uniform temperature T infinity. And as the fluid flows over the plate, heat will be transferred between the plate and the fluid. If we were to look at the fluid, you would see that as we move away from the plate in the Y direction, the temperature gets closer to the free stream temp temperature. We can define the thermal boundary layer such that Ts minus T at some location Y divided by Ts minus T infinity is equal to 0 0.99. So you might be wondering how those things are related, the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer. Well, the thermal boundary layer and the velocity boundary layer are related via the Prandtl number. This is, this is the general relationship where n is a positive exponent. Um, the Prandtl number is a ratio of the viscous effects versus the thermal effects. Let's take a look at how those things are related on a graph. So here's our velocity boundary layer, uh, boundary layer thickness, um, how it's changing as we move down the plate away from the leading edge as X increases. For oils or things with very high viscosities, the Prandtl number is very high. So you would expect that the velocity boundary layer uh, would be much larger than the thermal boundary layer. For gases, the Prandtl number is close to one, maybe a little less, so the boundary layer is of similar thickness. Uh, liquid metals, which they have a very high thermal conductivity, their Prandtl number is very low, so the thermal boundary layer is large in comparison to the velocity boundary layer. All right, so if we zoom in on the plate and we take a look at the molecules at the surface, right at y equals zero, we can see that the fluid velocity there is zero due to the non-slip condition. As we go farther from the surface, as we would expect, those molecules are moving faster, as indicated by the longer and longer arrows. We could do a surface balance on the molecules at some location x, um, where y is equal to zero, and we see that the heat transfer rate by conduction from the plate is equal to the heat transfer rate by convection. So let's put this in terms of heat flux to eliminate that area. We use Fourier's law and Newton's law to define those heat fluxes. Note that for Fourier's law, we're using the thermal conductivity of the fluid, since we're doing energy balance on the fluid molecules at the surface of the plate with zero velocity and thus are transferring heat by conduction. Now we solve 
for our heat transfer coefficient. Now what we do is we non-dimensionalize our problem. Instead of talking about the temperature at some location y, we define T star. Instead of talking about locations x and y, we normalize them to the length. Same thing with the velocities. U star is defined as the velocity normalized to the free stream velocity in the x direction. V star is the velocity in the y direction normalized to the free stream velocity in the y direction. Um, you can see that if we take the derivative of t star with respect to y star, uh, we can get it in terms of some more familiar things. We can plug this in the equation for h, and then we get rid of some terms and see the negative sign cancels out. So what you see is that we have defined h in terms of some non-dimensionalized terms. So let's introduce another non-dimensionalized term, the Nusselt number. This is our non-dimensionalized heat transfer coefficient we can see how this is related to the non-dimensionalized temperature gradient. Um, so now it's time to introduce the concept of local and average parameters. So we can define the Nusselt number, that non-dimensionalized heat transfer coefficient at a specific location x, or we can average it over the entire plate if we want to. We can even express parameters as an average up to a specific location x or between two specified locations. The nomenclature gets a little confusing in your book, so I have it in a table here. So let's look at the convective heat transfer coefficient first. The local heat transfer coefficient is defined at a specific location x. You may also see a heat transfer um, coefficient defined at the trailing edge. Don't get confused with the way it's written. This is still the local coefficient, not the average. Now, if we want to express the average heat transfer coefficient, we can integrate the expression for h at, over the plate, or from x equals 0 to whatever location that we need, which in this case is the trailing edge at, of x equals 0. Um, do keep in mind that the local heat transfer coefficient is dependent on whether the flow is turbulent or laminar, so you may have to consider the local heat transfer coefficients for both cases if the flow has regions of laminar flow and turbulent flow. In the special case of a flat plate, this expression can be put in terms of L. Um, this means that you can define the heat flux at a particular location, or you can define the average heat flux over the entire plate. So we have a lot of different nomenclatures here. Um, the local value at some location x and the average of that parameter over the entire plate or over a certain section of the plate are the values that are most commonly used in this class. You can do the same thing with the Nusselt number. Keep in mind that if you want the average Nusselt number, you're going to have to define it in terms of the average heat transfer coefficient, which is calculated uh, by integration over the plate. So it's the heat transfer coefficient, not the Nusselt number, that's integrated. We can also extend this to sh the shear stress and the friction coefficient. Um, you can define a local shear stress uh, as a function of the local friction coefficient, or you can talk about things in terms of averages. Um, of course, our Reynolds number is calculated at a certain uh, location x, um, and we'll use it to define the point uh, at the, uh, at the point at which the transition to turbulence occurs. Um, it doesn't really make sense to talk about an average Reynolds number. Um, well, I hope that was helpful, uh, a helpful introduction of the fundamental concepts of, of, of uh, convection. In the next video, we'll talk about some specific relationships that we can get for external flow over a flat plate.